Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Extended Disc webinar on Four Steps to Effective Communication. I'm your host, Hallie Bolander, and I'm here with Extended Disc Senior Trainer, Christina Bowser. How are you, Christina? Hi, everyone. Hi, Hallie. Good morning. And we're happy to have you here. Um, so just a couple reminders. Feel free to ask questions during our webinar if we have time, which we most likely will not, um, to follow up. We will follow up after, though, um, on your questions. And we will record this webinar as well and post it on our website sometime later this week. So, Christina, why are we doing a webinar on Four Steps to Effective Communication today? Well, I just want people to understand that the, the, our extended disc assessments, how we present our disc workshops, our support materials are based on these four steps to effective communication. And I just wanted to give everyone kind of a brief overview. And quite honestly, I mean, when we present something in like two, three or four steps, people are much more open to learning versus if I were to say to you, how about 10 or 15 steps to yeah, effective no, communication? Yeah, definitely wouldn't be able to remember that. Yeah, not as interesting. So um, let's talk about those four steps. What are they? So step one is basically what is DIS and C? Understanding the disc styles, how we're similar and how we are different. Um, step two is identifying your own style. style. So really raising that self-awareness and not just how we prefer to do things, but how do others see our style? It's not always the same. Um, step three is one of the strengths, not just of the disc model, but ex uh, of extended disc, but of the disc model itself is identifying the main disc styles of others. It's one thing to try to figure out what somebody is. And, but if you just have to kind of bring it down to, oh, is their primary style a D, I, S, or C? So only four styles that you have to recognize, it's not that more challenging. Step four is how do we modify our own behaviors to improve interaction and communication? That's where we're trying to get to. So again, we build our extended disc assessments on these four steps to make it easy for you to debrief and um, educate your clients and employees. So let's go into, of course, step one, which is what is DIS and C? And again, these are just overviews. We're just kind of giving you the highlights of how we would do it. Um, so I like to begin with the DIS model itself. The DIS model is basically these four quadrants, and you can see where DIS and C come from. And whenever I use the word model, I always tell participants, think of it as a map. Um, if I say the word diamond, if I say the word model, basically where you are graphed on this map tells you what your behavioral style is. And you can see that there's dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. And these are groups of descriptors, singular descriptors that describe each of the disc quadrants. But they're not set. So sometimes you might hear someone say the word driver instead of dominance for the D style. Compliance, sometimes people use the word correctness, conscientiousness. So there's no set groups of descriptors. But quite honestly, this is probably the last time I always tell people, you'll hear me use one word descriptors. Because what I find is that sometimes people will kind of push them away from the styles or disassociate themselves from a disc style because they don't strongly align themselves with these one word descriptors. So if someone is, let's say, an S style, but maybe steadiness isn't a word they use to describe themselves, I don't want them to disassociate themselves with the style because of that. So from here on out, you'll hear me use the letters D, I, S, and C and you can see they're color coded as they are here. Um, so let's get into the extended disc model. Basically, we took the four quadrant disc model and we enhanced it. We added another layer to it and you can see the diamond. We inserted the diamond so as if you're looking down on top of the diamond, you can see the different facets of the diamond and what those facets do is they divide each of the quadrants into specific sections. So it helps us to better identify um, the different styles for each quadrant. So what it is, it's a tool for observing and analyzing behavior. It helps us to, the simplest way of saying it, 
It's basically how do we prefer to go about the day? How do we prefer to do things? It's the behaviors that are most comfortable to you. And remember, behaviors are things that you can modify and adjust, sometimes not so easily, but doable versus your character or your personality or your traits are things that we can't make adjustments to. That's why we focus on these behavioral assessments. Um, extended disc, the way we like to present the diamond is we divide it into halves. If you look at the top half, you can see the D style and the C styles are representing the task or fact oriented styles versus the S's and I's on the bottom half represent the people and feelings half of the model. And it doesn't mean that D's and C's won't focus on people and feelings and vice versa, but they prefer to focus on tasks and facts. And there really is kind of a, just a nuance between the two. If I were an S or an I, people oriented, I might say to you, hey, how are you? Do you mind getting me the report? Versus a D or C, which are more task oriented, might say to you, do you mind getting me the report? Oh, and by the way, how are you? So very slight nuance between task and people. But then you divide the left side from the right side, the C styles and the S styles are what we call the reserve behavioral styles, meaning they're naturally more reserved and they prefer how things are. They will like to work in the past and the present. Um, they also rely on their five senses, meaning they want to know as much information as possible before they make decisions. And um, they tend to be slower in making decisions, but they tend to get it right the first time. We have the active styles, the D's and the I's. They're more focused on the future, how things could be, constantly changing, moving forward. And instead of wanting all the details and relying on their five senses, they rely more on their gut instinct, the sixth sense. The D's, because they're task oriented, do it based on the facts they know. Doesn't mean they want to hear every fact you give them, but as soon as they have enough information, boom, they make a decision. Eyes also make decisions very quickly, but theirs are much more impulsive and intuitive. What I want people to take away from when they are understanding or learning about their disc style and reading their reports, we have all styles. Every one of us has D, I, S, and C in us. What the report tells you is which styles will tend to come most naturally or comfortably to you and which styles take more energy or effort or not natural to you. And with the extended disc model, we can have up to three styles naturally. We will always have a minimum of one style that is not comfortable to us. And how do we define successful people and leaders? We say they come from all styles. Regardless of the styles, the ones that are most successful are the ones that have a great self-awareness. They are confidently self-aware. They know their strengths. They also know their areas where they need to develop. But what takes them to that next level is that they have the ability to modify their behavior to improve communication. Um, so... Before we get into the D, I, S, and C, the tip that I usually give to my um, participants is remember five things about each disc style. First, where does it fall on the model? Where does it fall on the diamond? So you can see the example here is the D falls in the top half of the model, meaning they're task oriented, and they fall to the right side of the model. They're active. Next is attributes. What words would you use to describe this style. What happens to the style under pressure? What is the biggest fear for this style? And put a visual example in your head about the style. Is there someone you know, whether they're famous or just someone you know in your professional or personal life that reminds you about the attributes of this style in case, you know, you draw a blank on it? So let's start with the D style. D styles are, again, task oriented and active. If I had to kind of summarize a D style, they're all about accomplishments. They're focused on task and getting it done, especially their own. They want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. They really aren't as focused on what is going on between A and B. But how do I get from A to B so I can go from B to C, C to D, etc.? 
So Hallie, do you mind taking us through kind of the characteristics overviews of the D style? I would love to. So D's are, remember, they are in the top right hand quadrant of the disc diamond right between task and active. Some attributes to describe them would include decisive or tough, very strong willed, competitive and demanding, independent and self-centered. Under pressure, they appear to have a lack of concern for others and kind of seem insensitive, but that's only because they're so focused on the task. Their biggest fear is loss of control, and that means that Ds like to be large and in charge. Now, Christina, do any examples come to mind when you think of a D style? Well, I could just think of those two candidates that were in our last presidential election. <laughs> um, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton come to mind. How about you, Hallie? I would say Simon Cowell, just because he's pretty blunt, and especially when he was a judge on American Idol. Exactly. Doesn't filter. Just one point I want to mention is when you look at these descriptors, remember, actions and behaviors themselves are neutral. The act of doing something is neutral, but based on our own disc style, we add value to it. So when a D style sees words like strong-willed, competitive, demanding, they basically own it. They give it a positive value or a neutral value. You show these same words to a different style, for example, the S style. When they see words like demanding, strong-willed, they see it in a neg with negative value that the D style does not. So just remember, behaviors themselves are neutral. Based on our own style, we add value to it. All right, so let's go on to the I style. I styles are active, like D styles, but instead of being task focused, they are people oriented. We say the I style ba never meets a stranger. Every act interaction is an opportunity to socialize. So Hallie's going to take us right through um, the iStyle overview. Yes, so iStyles, remember, they are in the bottom right-hand quadrant of the disc diamond between active and people orientation. Just some attributes to describe them. They're very sociable and enthusiastic, energetic and persuasive. They're very talkative and open as well. Under pressure, they can appear disorganized, but that's only because they're so concerned about people and feelings that the details sort of fall in the cracks. Eyes fear social rejection, and they never want to be on the outside looking in. Uh, do any examples of individuals come to you when you think of an eye style, Christina? Well, uh, Hallie and I are from different generations, so <laughs> let me just talk in terms of generation. I would say for my generation, Goldie Hawn is a great example. So for those of you that connect to Goldie Hawn, if you connect to Hallie's generation, it would be her daughter, Kate Hudson. So those are two examples. <laughs> How about you, Hallie? I would say Robin Williams, just because he's very comedic and very sociable and enthusiastic. Yeah, and that just reminds us that, you know, it's not based on their profile, too, or their hardwired style. It's based on their public persona when we say mm -hmm. think of um, someone to remind you of I styles. All right, so let's go on to S styles. S styles, I would say, out of all four styles, are the hardest to recognize. The reason being is um, the D, I, and C are styles that are very clear cut, almost in your face. It's easy to recognize. I styles, when you look at the descriptors that Hallie will describe, much softer, um, so much more challenging to recognize. Um, S's, like I's, are people oriented. They like people, but because they are reserved, they like people they know friends, family, and yes, even sometimes even coworkers. They are all about relationships. So Hallie, take us through the S. So S's are in the bottom left-hand quadrant of the disc diamond, right between reserved and people-oriented. Uh, some attributes of an S style include calm and steady, careful and patient. They're really your team players and they're very trustworthy, good listeners. Under pressure, though, um, S styles can be seen as too willing or overly accommodating to people's requests. Uh, S styles, they fear loss of stability and they don't really like change or surprises. Their motto sort of is, if it's not broken, let's not fix it. Um, I would say since, you know, they're the hardest to identify, can you think of any examples of S styles? Um, I would say the ones that probably stand out for me is if you think of athletes. That's an easy way to do it. Anyone that is that kind of unselfish team player. So, you know, Magic Johnson, yeah, he's magic. He's an eye. <laughs> but when he's on that court, when he was playing basketball, um, he's the epitome of that unselfish team player. And you might argue with me, but Peyton Manning, if you look him up, 
whenever he talks about uh, whenever he's interviewed, he's always talking about team, giving shout out to his team players. Um, how about you, Helly? Any ones that stand out to you? I would say the most would be Princess Kate. Uh, she kind of has that demeanor of an S style that's very family oriented mm -hmm. and loyal and calm. Exactly. So kind of the, just the tip to walk away with the S styles. Because they're the hardest to recognize, um, I always tell people, try it by eliminating the styles you know they are not. Or um, if you can't figure it out, I almost say uh, almost always they're going to be an S style. So let's go to the final one, which is the C style. They are task oriented like the D style. However, they are more reserved. So to distinguish them, they want to get from point A to point B, just like the D style does. But they're going to be more focused on what happens between A and B. If A.1, A.2, A.3 is not correct, they may never get to point B. So Hallie, you want to cover point uh, C styles? Yeah, so um, Cs are in the upper left-hand quadrant of the extended disc diamond right between task orientation and reserved. Some attributes would include very precise. Uh, they follow rules. They're very analytical and kind of perfectionist and logical in their systems. Um, under pressure, they can appear overly critical, but it's really important to understand that C styles are even more critical of themselves. They fear criticism of their own work as well, and that's because they believe so highly in quality work. Um, can you think of any examples of a C style? I say, usually, I, again, going back to athletes, any athlete that has a very methodical approach to their sport. So Tiger Woods is someone that comes to mind. Um, how about you, Hallie? I would say uh, Hermione from Harry Potter. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where does it show up in the extended disc assessment? Like I told you, this extended disc assessment is based on the four steps to effective communication. Once you understand the basic individual assessment, you'll be able to read the sales report, leadership, customer service, etc. So step one, where it shows up, is basically the introduction. What is DIS and C? Gives you a quick overview. Um, and then, of course, now we're going to get into step two, which is identifying your own style. Step two is becoming more self-aware of our own DISC behavioral style. It's a good place to provide your clients and employees with their DISC assessment now that they have a clearer understanding of what is DIS and C. So before I go into the actual report, I just want people to know there's no good or bad or better or worse. We don't classify people that way. There's no right or wrong answers. Um, the questions are hard, but they're based on your self-assessment does not limit your ability to develop in any area, can't use it as an excuse. And what are we measuring? Um, what we are not measuring is your intelligence, your skills, your ability or attitude. We are focused on how you prefer to do things. What is a person's natural behavioral style? So in the report, step two begins with the profiles. Um, profiles give you your disc styles. Um, they focus the report itself is going to focus on your natural style, which is profile two. Profile one, we don't put much emphasis on. In fact, I would tell people that anywhere from 95 to even my boss, Marcus, says 99% of the report is focused on your natural hardwired style. And we focus on it because if we know how we tend to behave and also how we tend to become more of our style when we are under pressure, remember, Strong emotions, stress are the enemies of behavior modification. Once we know that about ourselves, we have a base point for making appropriate modifications to our style. We're not going to go into detail here about it, but if you need a quick refresher on reading profiles, uh, Marku and I did a webinar that we've recorded on our website called Interpreting Disc Profile. So check it out. It's only 30 minutes. Then you can see where the actual placement is on the diamond. Um, so we always say the starting point is the dot. The starting point of the diamond or the dot on the model is a person's profile too. And we're looking on the page on the right side. It's also represented by the shading of an individual's disc style. So the pink area is that person's natural style and the dot and the shading are in the eye quadrant. We automatically know this person is a dominant eye. 
the shading itself represents the area of flexibility or the comfort um, areas for this individual, the profiles or the distyles in which they can flex constantly all day long, depending on what role and situation they're in. It's not a um, distyles that they will stay in. They will always go back to their new, their home base, which is that pink natural area. Um, a better way to explain this is think of the pink zone as your home. When we're in our home, we're our most natural, comfortable self. The darker gray area is the area of like our neighborhood. We're still basically ourselves. The lighter gray area is the distyles that represent, you know, like our section of town. Sometimes we might have to ask ourselves, do we turn left or right? But for the most part, we know where we are. We know who we are. The white area is the area that is uh, takes energy and effort. So we go into the big city. We meet our friends, have dinner and drinks, have a great time. But have you ever gone home back to your house and opened the door, walked in and kind of go, ah, I'm home. <laughs> it's that same idea. You know, it took energy and effort, not about ability when you're in that white zone, but we always want to go back to our comfort zone whenever possible. I really like that analogy, Christina. Thank you. Visual <laughs> person that I am. Um, so strengths is another section of the report. It also, but what I kind of want to talk about is not the fact that it's strengths, but it's the list sections, I call them. Motivators, demotivators, reaction to pressure situations are also areas that have lists in our reports. And I want you not to think of these lists as a checklist where everything must be present or not present in order for the individual to perform effectively. Think of it as a list from which you can prioritize and then work on these. If they're motivators, how do you bring promote them in your environment to do a better job? If they're demotivators, how do you make sure that you modify your style accordingly and ahead of time so that they don't demotivate you when they show up? It's also a dynamic list. We change our roles and our settings all the time. Revisit it. What motivated you now may not motivate you six months from now. The other part of the report in general are what we call the behavioral competencies. They are bar graphs that correlate, each one correlates to a behavior. Um, and the easiest way is to divide the bar graph in half. Anything to the right half, that means that that behavior is comfortable for you. Anything on the left side, that behavior takes energy and effort. Again, it's not about ability. The boxes themselves represent your profile too, natural style. The first thing people always look at are those numbers. They think five is good, negative five is bad. The numbers themselves are a representation of how much energy it takes for someone with your distyle, natural distyle, to perform that behavior. So anything that is positive and more positive, more comfortable, less energy. Anything that is negative or more negative simply means that you have to focus and use energy to perform that behavior. And you'll see this throughout the report um, under different categories like communication, decision making, sales, leadership. You'll see these behavioral competency bar graphs. So moving on to step three, very quickly, um, how do we identify the main distyles of others? One of the strengths of the DIS model, again, is that you can learn to identify what is the primary distyle in others. It just takes practice. We use the OR acronym, observe, assess, and recognize. Um, that's the steps we take to help us identify. To do that, you can see it in the report, exactly what I'm going to briefly cover now. Um, it's written right there in the report. Step three, how to identify the styles of others. So first, we observe. What do they talk about? How do they say it? Their tone of voice, body language. Then we think about what do distyles tend to talk about? Ds will talk about themselves. They're individualistic, future focus, both Ds and Is. But Ds will focus more on goals and results, whereas Is will focus more on people and positivity. Ss are your team players. They're going to talk about agreements and their team, and Cs are about details and facts and analyses. So it takes us right into the next step of the OR acronym, which is to assess. We went from observe to assess, and it's in the report where we're asking ourselves, are people more reserved or are they more active? And the description of reserved is um, they prefer the here and now, 
calm, quiet voice, hesitant eye contact versus active, future focus, loud voice, strong, assertive body language, strong eye contact. Once you've established reserved active, then you go to tasks versus people. Are they more focused on task or people? People oriented is going to be more emotional. Task oriented tends to be less emotional. From that point, we go to the R in the OR acronym, which is to recognize. If someone is more task oriented and more focused on getting things done and very quickly, chances are their primary style is going to be a D style. Then we move on to our last step, which is step four. How do we modify our own behaviors to improve communication and interaction? So to do that, we have to become obviously more self-aware. This is my touchy-feely slide. Um, you have to accept who you are. There's no good or bad. We are responsible for our own behavior. We choose or we no choose not to modify our own behavior. Um, accept others. As much as Hallie and I want people to change <laughs> for the better, the unfortunately, the only person we can change and control is ourselves. So Hallie, golden rule. Were you brought up with it? Of course. My mom always said, treat others the way you want to be treated. So it's a great, it's a great baseline for empathy. We want others to be treated. We don't want to be treated badly. Why no. would we treat any <laughs> other one badly? But it's not always as efficient to do that in a professional setting. So readjust the way you think about it. If you treat others the way they want to be treated, if we make those adjustments to make the other person um, understand what we're saying, hear what we're saying in, in a way that they are more comfortable, chances are we're going to have a much more successful interaction. Mm -hmm. Where step four shows up in the report are how these tips, and these are tips that are not just based on whether you're a D, I, S, or C. They are specific to your D style. And it's how do you communicate with a D? How do you communicate with an I, S, or C? Again, they're based on your D style. And there are many tips that are available, not just about communicating, but as a a manager or as a salesperson. So why do we do these four steps? What is the point of going through all this? Um, we want, we have a certain way that we prefer to behave. It's our most comfortable way to do it, but we know that it's not always the right fit or the right uh, behavior to present in different roles and situations. We also want to, uh, we also know that in our jobs, we have certain roles that we need to do that are outside of our comfort zone, not natural to us. But we need to, to kind of push ourselves outside in order to do our job successfully. And hopefully the goal here is to recognize that we have a preferred way of doing things. But if we learn and practice to kind of get outside our comfort zone, um, then the learned behavior becomes more natural. Doesn't mean it becomes natural-like, but hopefully it gets to the point where it doesn't drain us of energy. Um, and of course, we have ways of reacting to things that we don't think about. Not always the best behavior to present. So if we know how we tend to show up under stress or in reactive modes, can we proactively think of a better way to, to behave? Ultimate goal, why we do four steps to effective communication is a strategic communication response. Knowing ahead of time how we prefer to do things, how we show up under stress, how we tend to autopilot our behavior um, will make it more effective if we can make those modifications as an action plan ahead of time. So Hallie, why don't you just kind of talk a little bit about what is this four steps to effective communication workbook? Um, so the four steps to effective communication workbook is essentially everything that we had went over in this webinar, and this is one of Extended Disc's uh, support materials that we offer to our clients. Um, and I would say here, Extended Disc employees kind of see this as the Bible because it goes into specifically each disc style and basically all the four steps. And it's really important too as well how Christina had mentioned throughout the webinar that these four steps are truly built into our reports as well. Um, can you think of any other support materials that go over the four steps as well? Yeah, so obviously the reports, um, the effective communication workbook, and 
we have a facilitator's guide and the facilitator's guide is basically how do you conduct a disc workshop um, it takes you through it we have the powerpoints we have the curriculums we have the exercise and again it is based on those four steps to effective communication um, all right everyone thank you for joining us for our webinar on the four steps um, like we said in the beginning, this will be recorded and posted on our website sometime this week. And if you had any questions, we will follow up after this. Um, please feel free, though, to visit our website, extendeddisc.org, and follow us on at extendeddisc on the various social media sites you see presented here. Um, and we will get back to you. Oh, just quick question since I can answer it. What Somebody asked what is the letter R in the OR acronym when in identifying. It stands for recognize. Um, so again, thank you all and uh, we'll be in touch.